title of my talk is Thinking in Film. And both words have a very strong meaning. Thinking is what we do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And film is, in the case that I'm going to talk about, is the medium, but also the partner in that thinking. Now, the opening sequence of our film, Madame B, posits ruin, as you see here on the left, uh, the upper left and the lower right. This ruin is the present state. What follows got us back there in a circular movement that turns out a vicious circle. Thus, the opening credit sequence, this is from the beginning of the film, foretells the mode of storytelling based on circularity, repetition, and an undermining of the narrative movement forwards that we always count on. The idea is to immerse viewers in affect from the beginning. That affect is both a condition for thinking in film, because it helps viewers to watch with a delicate balance of empathy, hence understanding, and critical distance at the same time. And this is what I'm going to talk about, because I think this is the important thing that we have to do as cultural citizens about the culture. Among the many small events in Emma's life, Emma is the main character, are those where her loneliness becomes apparent, her sense of not belonging. Cultural citizenship is here demonstrated in the negative. It's actually a very sad film and a very sad story. In school, Emma dreams away during classes about reality. But she's the best student in the singing class. She takes extracurricular lessons in art and deportment for elegance. She's talented, but she lacks commitment to the present, the world, and social reality. She declines, one could say, her cultural citizenship, or she's not able to endorse her cultural citizenship, and as a result, she is ostracized. Other people gossip about her, even at her own wedding. This is one of the most painful scenes in the film. She's radically alone. How to explore this cinematically in a way that makes it, say, philosophically understandable and affectively effective? How can you be inside it and understand it? And I think this is the mission of uh, cultural analysis. For this, we staged particular kinds of looks to which social behaviors are bound and judgments frequently attached. Right after the school scene, we see Emma take care of the animals at her father's farm, initially with affection, but then realizing the boredom in her life. We all remember those moments in adolescence of utter boredom. Her footsteps on an empty path suggest she's walking away from the farm into a different kind of life. The movement of the handheld camera makes the viewer feel her walking and see what she sees. And this is how cinema can help us understand. What she sees, for example, the phantom of Charles behind a window, who is looking. Now, we try to create a visual form of encounter where the kind of looks determines both the beginning of a relationship and the inequality at the heart of it. Charles, also caught in a daily routine of loneliness and work, looks up and sees a handsome young woman or basically he looks down from above. He looks at her several days every morning, and his mode of looking can easily be seen as a tiny bit voyeuristic. He remains unseen, especially when he looks from the upstairs floor. He appears to see more than he can possibly see physically, detailing her body and her Face. This is a view where he sees her, but he cannot see her from so close because on the upper image you see how far he is from her. Emma, once she notices him and notices that he has noticed her, looks both shyly and flirtatiously. And this is the moment that two looks meet and determine a life where things go wrong. In the installations we made parallel to this film, we have staged these looks on two opposing screens. In order to hamper looking from a distance, the screens are so close as to make the viewing experience slightly uncomfortable. 
and to make it impossible to see both sides at the same time. Here you see a mock-up for the installation. The reality is a bit messier, but basically the idea is that this man is looking at her with Charles. But if you want to see Charles, you have to move, and then you cannot see her. And this wavering is the point, and we never realize how that happens. This is crucial if we wish to assess the political impact of art through affect. I remember very vividly my first encounter a long time ago with Flaubert's character, Emma Bovary, and the reaction that I had, if only she had gotten a life. Girl, get a job. Keenly aware of the remnants in my own contemporary moral environment or moralistic environment, starting myself to work while taking care of her family, I thought she should have been more active as a citizen of her world. What did she do? She made it all, she let it happen instead of making something happen. One can think that and cry hot tears at the same time. No one is protected from the pernicious attraction of cliches or as Flaubert called them, idées reçues. And this is the trap of culture, too. Now, I consider the task of the humanities to be understanding, analyzing, and explaining the importance of art from the past as well as the present for the contemporary world. That's the only world that counts. I have always been interested in movement as an integration of physical and emotional movement the trajectories of affect and perception. When I titled my talk, Thinking in Film, it was to foreground this double movement. Now, a bit of seriousness. French philosopher Henri Bergson. His book, Matter and Memory, is vital to this question. The book is from uh, 1896, so that's quite a while ago. It has not lost a single detail of its relevance. It states that perception is not a construction but a selection. The perceiving subject makes that selection in view of her own interests. Perception is an act of the body and for the body. It's not something that just happens. This selection takes place in the present. Not only the interests of the perceiver motivated, but also her memories. Charles looks at Emma, Emma at Charles, because even before seeing each other, they each had an interest to escape boredom, for example. Emma thought that Charles would make her escape the boredom of the farm. Charles thought that Emma would make him escape the boredom of his professional life of seeing to the sick. That this fails leads to a common interest, that this fails to lead to a common interest is because they do not reach a cultural belonging together. But the viewer too has her own interests. And viewers bring their own memories, different for each, to the combination of recognition and newness that the experience of art is. When points of convergence occur, a beginning of cultural citizenship emerges. At the end of his book, and I really recommend this book for you all to read, at the end of his book, Bergson writes, in concrete perception, memory intervenes, and the subjectivity of sensible qualities is due precisely to the fact that our consciousness, which begins by being only memory, prolongs a plurality of moments into each other contracting them into a single intuition. Now, this is very uh, philosophical, sort of arid prose compared to literary prose, but it's very clear and evocative. You know exactly what he's talking about. That coexistence of different moments or memories binds viewers to what they see. So there is not ever a single moment in the present. There is always this baggage that brings it together. The story may be fictional, the contact with it is real, and this is how art matters. This is how, retrospectively, in anachronism, we can still create a community for Emma, although at her time she didn't have one. Perhaps a community of women who understand both her craving and the mistakes she makes. 
This would enable her to be a cultural citizen of that community. Now, Bergson considers the body to be a material entity, and he consequently sees perception as a material practice. This makes his conception of the image synonymous with the moving image, and this is the, one of the points I want to make, that every image moves. But there is a deeper level on which images move. It comes closer to affect. The image, image itself, not its support, is both moving and material. It implies that it's plural and functional. It does something. It is performative, as we call it today. That something it does can be individual, but also social. Then the image becomes politically effective. Now, in 1907, Bergson coined the term creative evolution. Now, that term has all sorts of connotations that we don't like today, neither creative nor evolution, but they didn't mean it in that uh, sense. He used this term to account for this aspect of movement in the image, which occurs when the perception image, as Deleuze was going to call it, morphs into an affect image and makes the perceiver develop a readiness to act. And that is where the, ac the agency of art comes in. This readiness, not the potentially resulting actualization, but the readiness to act lies at the heart of the political potential of art. Now, with these thoughts in mind, I have some 12 years ago felt compelled to explore these imbricated aspects of images as moving in experiments in filmmaking. I wanted to understand how culture works in the present. First, I made a range of series of experimental documentaries and separations is one of those, trying to make the, the form of the film really subordinate to what was happening with the, the people in the film. We sought to facilitate the self-narration of their subjects, as the people are called, but I just can't bear to pronounce that without qualification. We sought to facilitate the self-narration of the people, always encountered on the basis of intimacy, rather than constructing their stories for them and making them an example of something. This approach enhances the performative quality of filmmaking as a collective process. Stories in our films are not chronological, but emerge from associative links, constituting a kind of what we call in literary analysis, free and direct style. You know what that means? It's, it's when uh, you don't know if the character or the narrator is speaking, and it's sort of merging of the two. And this is based on affect. Now, when these videos turned out to be mainly exhibited in art contexts, we didn't plan that at all, it just happened, I began to think about what that might mean and how I could deploy such artistic expression to understand more and in more depth and nuances what it means to be a participant in, yet also analyze, contemporary culture. In other words, what is cultural citizenship? When you are a co-citizen of people, you don't know, and you must know. I became involved in exploring what thinking in film could mean. And thinking about contemporaneity, about culture now, Flaubert's novel Madame Bovary insinuated itself, and in the rest of my talk you will understand why. For this project, the first impulse has been a consideration of the increasing importance of affect in the economic and of the economic in affect in culture. The bond between visuality, romantic love, and capitalism. Israeli sociologist, this image is the key image in a sense, so look at it well. Israeli sociologist, Eva Ilus, developed a concept emotional capitalism. And that concept has been a tremendous help for us to realize how urgent a reflection on these connections is. Being a cultural citizenship today involves understanding how we all participate in causing the economic crisis that we then accuse the banks of causing. And of course, the banks are a bunch of bandits, but so are we. 
in critically resisting while also acknowledging our complicity. And that ambiguity, that ambivalence between acknowledging that we are part of it, but not sitting and waiting for us to die, but then resist. That is the cultural citizenship that is needed today. And this is for me the value of thinking in film, because in a film you can then explore what that looks like, and here is what it looks like. You see her insecure face looking in the mirror, and the insecurity and the grief about failing herself and her standards that has, have come to her from the outside, and then this very affectionate guy who is about to sell her for 4,000 euros. Mm -hmm. To demonstrate <coughs> how such thinking goes, let me now take you through a few other issues that the film helps us not only understand, but also effectively grasp. And tomorrow night we'll talk more about this, right? Okay, so go back to the beginning. I return to the scene with which I began. Charles sees more of the young woman than he can logically, physically see. The imagination kicks in. Imagination, which is a key element in our being in culture. Two looks that are socially ambiguous begin to have consequences when they cross. The mode of filming <coughs> is designed to stimulate an effective looking with. This stimulates an awareness of the two looks as different and complementary, and possibly a partial identification with either one. And remember the man standing between the screens. With whom is he going to look? Or the difficulty of choosing, which is also a very disconcerting, disorienting moment. That difficulty, in turn, solicits self-reflection in the viewer, an awareness of what seeing means and does. The slow awakening of the performative look, a look that acts, is what we see. And this explains in visual, audiovisual form, the social functioning of looking itself. That the performative efficacy of an image depends on the look one casts on the other, means that the ontology of the visual is fundamentally dialogic and performative. And I think that is a really important point. We don't talk so much about ontology these days, but I think the ontology of the look as dialogic and performative for every act of looking is really important to keep in mind. Now, the two kinds of look, voyeuristic and, and flirtatious, are subject to judgment. Oh, she's such a flirt. Oh, he's just a creepy voyeur. But the performativity makes such judgments uncomfortable because we stand there and we choose one of the positions. Now, a second example, the wedding, the resulting wedding that results from that crossing of the looks. It's an event, both public and private, one we all recognize and obeying the ideology of romantic love, consider a moment of happiness, her big day. We say her big day, right? Yes. It's also a day of rituals, of pre-scripted behavior. In that sense, it's relentlessly impersonal. Small incidents enhance the ambivalence of weddings. And in the case of Madame B, Emma's wedding is the moment where her cultural citizenship is actually definitively breaking down. She's not accepted by the others. She does not belong on her own wedding. And you'll see this is one of the most painful scenes in the film. Okay, so here is one of those little incidents. A stranger, an uninvited guest, behaving like a social outcast, which is our equivalent, and this is a whole other story, the intertextuality with Flaubert's novel, it's the equivalent of the blind beggar. But we made that a woman makes a disturbing appearance at the party. Dressed in white, she appears like an abject double of the bride, making Emma more insecure. She will appear again on several occasions, including Emma's death. So Emma is lonely at her own party. We see her being shy, not knowing quite how to behave, and trying her best to do what is expected of her, to belong. And she tries hard, so hard, to be nice that it's painful to look at. 
The judgmental attitude of the people around her is expressed in the soundtrack of gossip. And here I want to mention our brilliant sound artist, Portuguese Sara Pinheiro, who made a soundtrack that is so amazing that you, you watch, Emma, you don't see these other people, but you hear them. You don't understand what they say, but you know it's judgmental. You know it's negative. So <clears throat> these, this is one way that we show this. And visually, in moments when handheld camera and play with blurring alert us to the presence of others who are themselves unseen, but they do busily cast Emma out. So all you see is Emma being cast out. You don't see by whom. Quite painful. Now this scene then raises questions of social behavior along with questions of private and public, spontaneous and ritualized behavior. It circumscribes how precarious cultural citizenship is, especially for people like here a woman who are not automatically accepted. And it's so precarious because you cannot go to the uh, city hall and claim it. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It is, um, uh, well, you'll, you'll see it tomorrow, but it's a really horrible moment. Now, another example is the reception. Uh, it's another instance that marks for Emma the end of hope. In Flaubert's novel, written at a time when nobility was already obsolete, yet still quite present, Emma's final moment of illusion that her marriage can make her happy is the ball at the castle of the Vaubiessard. I don't know if you've read the novel, but she's, they are invited, because her husband has cured someone, invited to go to a ball at the, a castle. Wow. This is a key moment, an experience of almost belonging, almost acceptance, but not quite. And afterwards, definitively not. A contemporary equivalent, it seemed to us, and this contemporaneity was very important to when we made the film, a contemporary equivalent would be a reception given by a commercial power. The association, we chose the association of pharmaceutical companies in France, Pharma France. Now this, of course, is an allusion to many different things, in this case, four different things. An important tool, illusion, is an important tool for thinking in film because it helps to think complexity in a way that uh, like a philosophical argument would have more trouble with. And here we have four. It demonstrates the richness of what the moving image is capable of, simultaneously inv invoking a combination of uh, pensive threads, you could say, of threads of thought. Emotional capitalism... Second, to the character of Omer, the pharmacist, who is going to be the cause of Emma's downfall. Third, to the fact that today Emma would be taking antidepressants, wouldn't she? And four, to our previous work, A Long History of Madness, where we opposed psychoanalytic treatment to the current popular and devastating treatment with drugs. So these are four arguments that just come together in the choice of this reception, as uh, the reception of Pharma France, reception for the beginning of the new year. So they go to the party. Emma is excited. Her first reaction is to ask her husband if she can buy a new dress. This is her first foray into the lures of capitalism. Of course, he says. For her, city Invited in Paris, the city that means glamour, and glamour is costly. So she overdresses. The dreamt of event in the glamorous world turns out a nightmare. The other guests, and that's what you see here, freeze when they see her because they are all just in casual dress and she's in this red ball dress. They do not admit either Charles or Emma into the small circles of their conversations. And everything Emma does in seeking the limelight is slightly out of place. She has an awkward conversation with a handsome man, dances with him, and that's it. One dance. More loneliness, isolation, and shame. This is the image of not belonging, of the denial of cultural citizenship. She's not admitted. 
Simple as that. Awkwardness is the expression of that denial. Now this scene, here she is dancing and that's after the dance. This scenes, scene concerns moods. Moods impact on viewers and make them accept the propelling movement of narrative. But they can also counter that very mov movement and instead hamper linear progress, make viewers stop, and thus create circles of thought in multiplicity. Now our endeavor was to maintain a tense, unstable balance between a critical and an empathic view of Emma. And so everybody says, oh, she's impossible, and why does she do be so stupid and all that? We try to make that an uncomfortable position and make us feel that it could have been me if I had been a little less lucky. Okay, the visuality of the images enhances this uncertainty. Moments of painful awkwardness occur. First, facing their ostracism together, Charles and Emma soon end up alone when Emma dances and Charles tries not to look. Now pay attention to that scene. He's really, he's standing there in her face and in the face of the other man and he's doing so, such an effort to not see it. It's really funny. And then when Emma overeats to compensate for her frustration. In keeping with our conception of narrative as circular, and also in keeping with Flaubert's deployment of symbolic prediction in the scene of the ball, we hint at the overdosing of powder sugar. And later we have Emma appear as a ghost. And that's here. Unseen by the others, including Charles. Now, this is another form of making complex uh, making thought more complex by illusion, by means of illusion. Uh, you could call this the politics of illusion because it goes somewhere, but not in a straight way. The fourfold illusion I mentioned uh, just now in the updating of the castle to an industry was one example of this. The ghost appearance is another. This is also a little homage to my dear colleague Esther Pieren, who wrote a beautiful book on specters. To see these solutions to the ending, we must be willing to give up on narrative streamlining and consider the image as double by definition. An illusion is not a metaphor. Instead of replacing one thing with another, as a metaphor does, which is a sort of a comfortable way of dealing with ambiguity, an illusion unfolds the alluded into what we see. It stays there. Illusion operates not on an either-or structure, but on an inclusive model, both and, or as well as. Now, another layer of thinking in film concerns the complexity of time. And to make it simple, anachronism is the figure of thought that is uh, a leading threat in this project. The contemporariness of Flaubert's novel is our starting point. We made, he, he made this work for the present. We made our work for the present. And that co combination of two works in different times, but made for their own present, is what matters. So we cultivate anachronism as an indispensable tool to understand how an artwork can be durably and duringly contemporary. Here and there, here in the upper left photograph, Allusions to earlier times participate, but do not replace the contemporaneity of what we see. Two aspects make for the aliveness for today of Flaubert's novel. Its theme and its visuality. Its theme is the intricacies between the combined lures of capitalism and romantic love, what I called emotional capitalism. As such, it connects Flaubert's time with ours. And that connection is what we don't want to know, because we think we are way beyond this romantic time, but we are not. A product of the second half of the 19th century, steeped in late Victorian culture, Madame Bovary can be seen in relation to books such as Effie Briest in Germany, Anna Karenina in Russia, A Doll's House in Sweden, La Regenta in Spain, and I'm sure you have one, and Poland has one, and they all have one. Novels of Adultery, written by male authors. 
telling of ambitious and dejected women, often deemed hysterical, and who end badly, mostly, by suicide. Nice, huh? There is an anachronism in the theme itself. Because those novels gave a glimmer of women's desire and the horror it inspired in men, they nourished the emergent Freudian thought. The question, you all know the question, right? What does woman want? The question was in the air. And if Freud became its spoke spokesman, he did not invent it. He came up with it three decades later. In Madame Bovary, Flaubert integrated identification with such happy wives, with a fierce critique of capitalism. I don't know if you have read this novel recently, but it's just astounding how radical it is. This novel nourished a kind of inquiry that inspired Freud, and Freudian thought makes us look at the novel differently, back and forth, anachronism. The same with Marx and Marxist thought. This is the natural way of anachronism. Casting the novel in the past, making it historical, is anachronistic while attempting to avoid anachronism. Now, an obvious example of this is the opera scene. After having been dumped by her lover Rodolphe, Emma falls ill, and on the advice of the perversely malignant pharmacist Ome, Charles takes her out to see the opera Lucia di Lammermoor, to nourish her imagination. What the, is the opera's place? What's its function, its mode of operation in its time, historically speaking, and also its tense, so to say, its connotations? Lucia di Lammermoor, premiered in 1835 in Naples, it's a typical example of romantic opera based on an equally super romantic novel by Walter Scott, composed by Gaetano Donizetti with a libretto by Salvatore Comarano. It was only moderately successful, its success slow to develop, but enduring. When Flaubert was spending five years writing his novel, the opera was present in European culture. In France, in a libretto by Alphonse Royer et Gustave Weiss. But its contemporaneity was rather based on its enduring presence and a relatively recent memory of its beginning rather than a punctual actuality. It wasn't the opera of the day. It was an opera that was present. Exactly like the romantic spirit it stages, and which inevitably, I'm just already showing the... Uh, our alternative, the romantic spirit it stages, and which inevitably Flaubert was also mocking, it is the property of romanticism, as Cynthia Chase has often demonstrated in her publications, to always have that ambiguity, even with a touch of nostalgia. As a story, the tale of amorous madness, the excess of romantic love, went very well with Emma's spirit of boredom, barely recovered as she was from her long melancholy illness after being dumped by her lover. An object of longing anchored in a past where Emma was forging her illusions. In other words, one of the flaws of the young woman was her irreflexive anachronism, her projection from a present of desires that were already old and well-worn when they emerged. In the opera, female hysteria, not yet speakable, is concentrated on the scene where Lucia goes mad and in her madness, violent. Well, don't worry. Emma will take distance from it. I quote, Mais la scène de la folie n'intéressait point Emma et le jeu de la chanteuse lui parut exagéré. But the scene of madness was of no interest to Emma. And the acting of the singer seemed excessive. This after having been completely enamored of the singer. But, do I have this? No. Okay, I'll leave it here. At that indifference already put the love into which she is falling in the past tense. And this is the moment that she's going to fall in love. So what are we going to have for hope? The text says as much. As much. And in one of those semi-free indirect discourses that are neither free nor indirect, as Jonathan Culler has so superbly analyzed, 
Instead, it begins simply with a narratorial voice and a focalization by the character. Elle m'a rêvé au jour de son mariage, et elle se revoyait là-bas. Emma was dreaming of her wedding day, and she saw herself again there. So it is already a repetition. In order to then say, yes, free indirect discourse, the famous formula, contested in a court of law, complicit with the church, ah, see, si, and this is part of that scene, this is the, the sentence that got Flaubert a court case. Si, avant les souillures du mariage et les désil la désillusion de l'adultère, if only before the filth of marriage and the disillusions of adultery. And the judges said, reverse that and you're free to go. No, he was not going to reverse that. Emma places herself in anachronism. There where the past hides out, impossible to find, according to the ruses of nostalgia. But she is entirely lucid. What she lacks is a sense of the importance of, what past, of that past beyond nostalgia. And in spite of her enthusiasm of just a moment ago that she was really getting into it and really getting her imagination to work, the scene of madness of Lucia was of no interest to her. Free and direct discourse, focalization by whom, past or present, it's a total mess. The scene that accompanies or is the opera is a scene of anachronism where Emma experiences the impossibility of the past without interest for the others who live in her world. Now for us, the measure of loyalty to Flaubert was before anything else, the contemporary critique that speaks in opera as we were doing thinking in film, here there is speaking in opera. We wanted to create circumstances within which film would help us to understand our contemporary society better through understanding Flaubert's novel in relation to its time, the one through the other. For Flaubert, Lucia di Lamamore represented the romanticism he saw all around him. To keep the film contemporary, using the same opera is betraying it by anachronism. Choosing an opera that would today lend itself comparably to ridicule would miss Flaubert's point because it wasn't that ridiculing that counted. For he was not ridiculing the opera, his target was the lure, the misunderstanding, the way the public, including Emma and Leon, misconstrued the romanticism, overdoing it by projecting their own selfish desires onto it. Now, both Claude Chabrol about whom a little more in a minute, and Alexander Sokurov, authors of Madame Bovary films that rank among the best of the 25 at least, that I've seen at least, avoid the dilemma of opera. Thus miss, that is, the opportunity to let thinking in opera contribute to the relevance of their films by limiting the scene to some preparatory, vaguely classical music which leaves the door open to the question of Emma's interest and understanding. There is no connection. Her being in the world, participating in a community, or not. We chose instead... Do I have another one? No. No. Never mind. This is clear enough. And tomorrow you'll see five minutes of it. We chose instead William Kentridge's opera, Refuse the Hour of 2012, which was the moment that we started filming. This opera ridicules political issues, most powerfully colonialism, but doesn't just ridicule it. This is what Emma and Leon don't understand. Hence, we espoused Flaubert's interest in misunderstanding while using an opera that was vastly different from the one he invoked. Here, too, there is a touch of anachronism. Colonialism is also historical, or so we like to think. Kentridge doesn't think so, as much as Flaubert didn't think that Romanticism was of the past. We wanted an artwork that helps grasp the depth of Emma's incapacity to think socially as one of the causes of the enduring power of colonialism. This is a kind of anachronism that is a form of historical thinking, rather than the unreflected projected from the present to which historians are rightly allergic. So I think historians should be allergic to Chabrol's total fidelity to the period 
as an anachronism and not to our 2012 opera choice. Now, there are many films, as I said, historical, all historical costume dramas based on Madame Bovary. In its attempt at historical fidelity, this genre ruins the contemporaneity of the historical artwork, denies that problems persist in the present, even if in a different guise, and hampers the cinematic thought that is at the heart of cinema. I think it's contempt for cinema to do this kind of gorgeous, gorgeous, attractive, appealing, sexy historical costume drama. Instead of a narrative, we aim to create a performative film in the present tense. This entails a number of issues. For example, the long section of the film that alternates meetings with her lover, Rodolphe, dinner time with her husband, Charles, poor thing, interference from the outside world in the shape of Omer, the pharmacist, and her love affair with commerce. Four moments that pose the challenge that faces all translations of literature into film, how to show routine. In a novel, you can describe it and say this happens every day, but you cannot show it every day. So how to show routine even when it is disguised as exciting novelty. This is the this, the four scenes, and in the exhibition, they are in four screens that you sit in the middle of and you're surrounded by. In the film, of course, they alternate. The section stages the tension between event and routine in Emma's failing attempts to break the latter through romance and through acquisition, the one turning into the other. After the seduction, once he has her, Rodolphe, soon tires of her constant attempts at closeness and passion, her increasing demands on him. In the routine of the affair, Emma slowly understands that the man is not interested in the long-term commitment that she sees as an escape from her exasperating marriage. Moments of disingenuous passion alternate with unease and dawning understanding, and it's up to you tomorrow to, to see how the real passion becomes an enactment of something that's already desperate, that's already anachronistic. Now, the men in her life, her husband and her two lovers, are two alike. If you ask what went wrong with Emma, something went wrong in her choices. The mediocrity, so frequently assigned to Charles, but also to the other two men, is one aspect of the link between them. Here you see Rodolphe, still seducing and then being bored. And it's an amazing feat of acting, the way he does this. On the other hand, the problem also lies with Emma herself, whose education into being a good enough woman stunted her capacity to act and discern. She could not discern. Emma's drama is that she lacks dialogic performativity. She's in love with the idea of love, not with anyone in particular. This is why we cast the same actor to play the three men. And then people say, but why then did you dress them up differently? Well, if we had not done that, we would all say, ah, oh, Emma, how stupid. But I want you all to actually fall for it too. And he's such a good actor that you see, you see him as three different men. So we made him look different enough in the three roles so that viewers can mistake them for different. And I had one friend who saw the whole film and then said, what? Is that the same? <laughs> now you are foreborn, so it's not fair, but still. So I want you to be able to make that mistake and understand, therefore, Emma from within, and then see that she's not making distinctions. Now, the aspect of boredom, boredom of routine, is very difficult to audio-visualize, but it is the heart of the novel and of the project. Flaubert managed this. In the novel, there is an entire network of sounds characterized by indistinction, and here again, Sara Pinheiro did a wonderful job in making those sounds work. They are all the iterative, durable, routine sounds. My example, I'm just going to give you one example, is a sonic image outside of story time that becomes the source of narration on its own, imagistic, 
manner. It, this is an imaging of the famous sentence, la conversation de Charles est à plat comme un trottoir de rue. The whole world knows this sentence. His conversation was flat like a sidewalk. The sentence needed including not only as a narrative expression of a non-event, but also as a representation of, of the boredom that will kill Emma. It causes a reversal in the narrative economy and its dynamic between narration and description for us between literary and cinematic. The iterative character of the flat conversation implies that the sentence, the perception Emma has of its content, and the slide towards the adventure that follows, until death do them part, all this cannot easily be audiovisualized, especially not with Flaubert Flaubertian concision for which one comparison was enough. It is when they try hardest to do just that, that films based on the novel fail to engage. And now we soon get to see an example of that. The transformation of narrative discourse via uh, direct discourse into an audiovisual free indirect discourse was called for to implicate another short narrative sentence that resonates with the comparison. Especially during mealtimes, she couldn't stand it anymore. C'était surtout aux heures des repas qu'elle n'en pouvait plus. A narrative summing up follows this sentence. Toute l'amertume de son existence lui semblait servie sur son assiette. Again, a, a metaphor. Her entire bitterness of her existence seemed to her was served to her on a plate. Conflating the two short passages into a rather extensive audiovisual image does justice to the effective, although failed, dialogic nature of Charles' monologic conversations. And the cinematic, the thinking in film that I'm talking about here is to realize what it is exactly that those three short sentences say. Now, Chabrol had an easy way out. He quotes the sentences in voiceover, thus completely breaking the potential for empathy. And his voiceover reading the sentence, c'était surtout au repas, aux heures du repas qu'elle n'en pouvait plus, and, and uh, this thing about the flat conversation, it's a total cinematic disaster. And I really want to show this. It's a great film in many ways. It's not to trash Chabrol. I'm only criticizing people I really respect. Um, but now, can we make this work? Uh, sorry, it's a, short, a very short fragment, like 30 seconds. No, not this one. Yeah, that one. On a Mac, this would have worked with him. Oui. Okay. Oui, Anastasie. Il était tard. Je l'envoyais se coucher. Je ne veux pas la garder, Charles. Elle est trop vieille. À mesure que se serrait davantage l'intimité de leur vie, un détachement intérieur se faisait qui la déliait de lui. La conversation de Charles était plate comme un trottoir de rue. Il va pleuvoir. Et les idées de tout le monde y défilaient dans leurs costumes ordinaires sans exciter d'émotion, de rire ou de rêverie. Enfin, je crois. That's it. For me, this ruined the film. This was like, okay, I cannot do, I cannot think in film. So I don't do it. This was uh, really a, um, a disaster. So we tried something else. And we relied entirely on the actors for this, on a, and especially on Thomas. Instead of, in order to explore the difference between literary and cinematic narrative, we made an extensive, an extended sequence which, with entirely improvised acting, not scripted, where Thomas Germain developed four topics of utter futility. The weather, talk a lot about that, the lack of taste of raspberries when there is not enough sunshine. A neighbor who had an unfortunate little accident. And how to make cherry jam when the cherries have no taste. Mm -hmm. Now I show you just a little fragment from the ending of that sequence. To get a sense, there are no subtitles. You don't need the subtitles. He's just talking about making ch cherry jam and to get a sense of how boredom and horror are the product of these two people together, the collaboration. Can we have full screen? Okay. 
Okay. Okay. <rire> J'ai goûté les framboises cet après-midi. Je te conseille pas de faire des confitures parce qu'elles sont pas. Elles ont aucun goût. Elles sont complètement acides. Alors avec ça, tu vois, à moins de mettre. Euh, À moins de mettre 15 tonnes de sucre dedans, tu vois, t'en en gagneras rien. Et puis c'est euh, au mec qui m'a expliqué ça, je ne savais pas qu'il avait la vertu dans les, dans les framboises, il m'a expliqué comment les cueillir. Et j'ai l'impression que l'année dernière, on les avait mal cueillies. Il y a un moment pour les cueillir, si tu les cueilles le lendemain, elles ne donnent plus rien, elles sont trop mûres. Ça mûrit en fait très vite les framboises. Ce qu'on sait pas, c'est que c'est la façon dont tu les cueilles, tu vois. Si tu les cueilles... Parce que si tu les cueilles trop mûrs, en fait, tu les écrases. Et alors après, si tu peux en faire de la confiture, encore qu'il faut que vraiment quasi du goût, parce que tu fais pas de la confiture, si. Moi, de toute façon, tout ce qui est trop acide, je le déteste, ça, tu vois. Donc, euh, bon. je te dis, la confiture de cerise, si on arrive à les cueillir assez tôt, vu que les oiseaux viennent tout manger cette année, J'ai l'impression que quand même, tout ce qui est fruits rouges, ça perd de sa saveur. Cette année, au mieux me les disait, les cerises, ils n'ont rien récupéré. Ouais. Ça va Ça va Oui. Comprends. Demanderai à ma mère qu'elle fasse des confitures. Ça va Ok. Ok. How do I go back to my precious? Ok. Yeah, I'm sorry about the subtitle. I've made a mistake here, but anyway. The, um, you got the point, I could tell. <laughs> so, like the emerging contact out of two dubious, socially dubious looks in the first sequence, the two characters here produce the boredom ending in horror together. It is the spectator who, seeing and feeling the horror, reads the face, Emma's face is what you see mostly, and thus allows the boredom to become visible. And that's cinema. A film depends entirely on its cast and crew. It's an essentially collective process. And I can't tell you the gratitude I have towards all these incredible people who did such wonderful work. We have tried to develop and exploit that potential maximally by really making it a group effort and briefing and debriefing every day, having big meetings all the time. Some of the scenes we had not planned, but emerged from discussions with the participants, such as a few improvisations by Mathieu Montagnier, who wanted the Omer character, who wanted to give his character more depth. He said, this is, in Flaubert, it's a caricature. He needs more depth. He said, well, try it. We can always cut it out. I mean, I didn't promise beforehand that I would take it in, but hey, it was too brilliant to not take it in. But a film depends also entirely on its viewers to complete the narrative potential it has. If a viewer becomes impatient, then he or she may not be entirely there when Emma screams. Hence, the narrative itself, in the sense of an increasing tension, may fall flat. 
That is the risk and the challenge of thinking in film. And I hope that tomorrow evening you will join these people. Wait a minute. Where are they? These people. And the other participants in making this thinking in film work. Thank you. <laughs>